Hey everyone, I'm super excited to be speaking to Jennifer Doliak. Jen is about to join Arnold Ventures as head of their work on criminal justice, and I think she does amazing work bringing the economist mindset to challenges related to criminal justice, poverty, and discrimination. She hosts her own podcast at Probable Causation. Jen, welcome. Hello, thanks for having me. So let's start with crime. When I've looked at the crime data, it occurred to me it's not exactly clear what the trends have been in all different types of crime or why. My personal reading is it does look like long-term trends, say over the last 40, 50 years for violent crime seems to be down. And for overall crime as well, looks broadly down, say both in the UK and the US and other rich nations. But there's quite a lot of flux and quite a lot of regional or city differences. And then in more recent years, the trend in crime in anything in the US looks like it might have ticked up. It looks like it might have ticked up in a couple of other places as well. Although, again, unflux and uh, unstable in some other nations. So my first question then is, what do you think the trends in crime are? And maybe you can cut it in ways which you think are helpful, as in violent crime, nonviolent crime, crime in, in cities and and cutting it away from the long term and, 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 the, and the short term. Yeah, I mean, I think those those long term and short term uh, pictures you just painted are, are really the main stories um, when we think about the you know where we are in terms of public safety. Um, so there was this huge increase in violent crime, in particular, in the late nineties, late eighties, early nineties, um, and suddenly violent crime started falling dramatically uh, in the mid nineteen nineties. And we still aren't entirely sure why that is the case, um, this big mystery in the economics of crime world. Uh, but we do know that basically crime has been falling since then um, until very recently. And so, so during, uh, during the pandemic and, and since the pandemic, uh, we've seen this big uptick in homicide and shootings, um, at least in the US. And, uh, and again, we're not entirely sure why <laughs> that change is kind of like trying to uh, describe what's going on in the stock market, right? There are lots of sort of like little blips and everything, and you can have big picture understanding of, of the economy and, and what drives growth, um, but not be able to predict fluctuations in, in the stock market. Um, so it's similar with crime rates. Um, but, uh, but overall, we're still in a place where homicide rates and violent crime rates are much lower than they were um, in the, the early to mid 90s. So overall, things have gotten much safer, especially in our big cities, we're much safer. But of course, as you said, there's a lot of variation place to place, particular neighborhoods, particular communities bear the brunt of a lot of violent crime that is still going on. Um, and so it's a major public safety or ma major public uh, problem and, and uh, concern for policymakers in particular places. Um, and that has become more of a focus in recent years as homicides and shootings have gone up, which of course we're not used to after this big decline for decades. So when I was reading the literature, um, I was surprised by um, that observation and the comment that you make is that there isn't that much agreement as to the why on these trends and the why for the down and the why for the up, uh, mm -hmm. which is very uh, perplexing, which I guess is one of the reasons why maybe um, you know, the person in the street is kind of misunderstood what the trends were and certainly misunderstood as to, to what they were. I, I guess my thought is what are your best theories of, of why it was down and maybe why it's come up, whether you're kind of top two or three best kind of causal uh, explanations for it? Yeah, so there have been a lot of studies trying to nail down what happened, especially with that 90s decline. Uh, all kinds of theories have been thrown around. You know, there was a lot that was changing about criminal justice policy during that period in response to the rising crime rates. We increased incarceration, we increased policing. Uh, we know independently that both of those things reduce crime. And so it seems reasonable that, you know, we put a lot more police in the street, we lock up people for a long time. Uh, maybe that helps to reduce crime. Um, again, in general, that is true, but that doesn't seem to explain what happened in the 90s and why we saw this big decline in, in crime in the 90s. Um, other theories out there are removing lead from gasoline uh, in cars. Um, so if you remove lead exposure, you know, about 20 years earlier, uh, then those, those kids who would have been exposed to, to high lead levels grow up and are less violent, less likely to get themselves into trouble. And so maybe we see crime decline 
for that reason. Uh, others have, have suggested that it's a similar story, but abortion legalization. So really like explanations all over the map. My hunch about the 90s is it's honestly just a whole a mix of a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, I think the lead hypothesis is somewhat compelling, although we, again, like whether it could explain the whole decline feels like a bit of a stretch to me. We also uh, were benefiting during that period from a big investment in anti-poverty programs um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and having those kids grow up and have better opportunities surely uh, reduced uh, criminal involvement. Um, so yeah, so my best explanation is very unsatisfying. I think it was a lot of things in the 90s. Um, for the more recent uptick, the again, as you said, we don't really understand what's going on here. Um, I really thought, uh, and I think said on some podcasts early on in the pandemic that my guess was it was a lot of, you know, everybody's inside. Uh, you don't have as many eyes on the street. So there's this Jane Jacobs, uh, uh, urban, urban researcher uh, um, story that basically if you just have more people around who can be eyes on the street, then everything is safer. Um, you've got potential witnesses and so on. And so suddenly during the pandemic, we're not all out and about anymore. And so taking the eyes off the street means that people who want to go and, and cause trouble can uh, without any consequences. And so I sort of was hoping at least that that was a temporary change and you saw an increase in homicides and shootings, but then that would all decline when we started moving around again, it didn't. Um, and so that suggests we're in sort of a new, at a new equilibrium almost. So things just shifted. And in addition to a lot of people buying more guns at the beginning of the pandemic, seems like they're just more access to guns. Uh, maybe sort of we got to a point where everyone just has more guns and and also uh, there are sort of cycles of retribution if it's gang violence and so on. And so um, so we seem to be in a new equilibrium in a lot of cities where gun violence is just higher than it was pre-pandemic. So we're going to need different and we're going to need to actually do something about it, <laughs> which is harder. Um, I think all of that said, I mean, what makes me optimistic as a researcher is I think we're much better at figuring out what to do about these problems than we are at explaining why we are in this situation to begin with, right? So uh, so we don't necessarily need to understand why crime is higher now in order to figure out what works to reduce crime. Um, and so that that is helpful. We don't need to we don't need to fully under of course sometimes it can understanding root causes can help us come up with ideas about what to do, but it's not necessary. Yeah, that's a really good point. So the, empirically, we can do things that you know. So the pollution thing, imp improving neighborhoods. We might talk about some of this access to healthcare, summer jobs, mm -hmm. cognitive behavior therapy, a lot of things that have been shown uh, to work. Um, I guess, uh, speaking from here in the UK and in Europe, one thing um, Europeans can't get their heads around is, I guess, the whole gun issue. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I guess as, as, you've as you've raised it, it, it seems to... Uh, European people that guns must be uh, a really big um, answer to it. Um, I guess this is a little bit contested in the US from your reading of it. I mean, uh, what uh, what is the intersection of, of the whole gun issue? And is it a case that because this is all a minority or quite a large minority who own a load of guns and they seems to have been like a tipping point in certain communities or regions or zones, like you say, with intersectional with poverty or the uh, environment and, and kind of communities and it and it spills over. And there also seems to be some intersection with mental health because you've seen, you know, mental resilience issues also spark up. So you put some of these yeah. small factors together and like you say, you're getting one and one and one and one equals like this really uh, big thing. Um, I'd be interested in your views of, from that and explaining it to us here in, in Europe and the UK where we just don't quite understand uh, the issue around guns. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think a lot of people in the U.S. don't really understand either <laughs> why we're in this situation. <laughs> I mean, you know, a lot of people believe very strongly in Second Amendment rights to be able to own guns. Um, and so that uh, that makes meaningful gun control just very difficult politically to implement. Um, and so I often think of conversations about gun laws as being a little bit of a distraction if we're focused on like what policies can we implement to actually change things because it just it's just going to set off, you know, yeah. it's just going to uh, lots of fights. Yeah. But uh, but all that said, I mean, I think the challenge, one challenge here and the reason it's not sort of a, an immediate one to one like someone buys a gun and we see crime go up. Uh, you know, I think that 
there are lots of law abiding people who buy guns. One big challenge is that a lot of those guns get stolen. Uh, so I've actually been having a lot of conversations with people recently, um, including police officers who say like they they know like, you know, I live in Texas. Uh, they know if you see a pickup truck in a in a parking lot, uh, they could guarantee you there's a there's a rifle in the back of that pickup truck. Um, and uh, thieves know that too. And so you wind up seeing a lot of guns stolen out of cars. Um, a lot of people just, just store their guns in cars and they're not locked up. And so, uh, it's, it's interesting. I've just been having a lot of conversations about like, maybe we could get policies passed about having to lock up your guns when they're in the car. Um, so, so a lot of a big, so there are some places like that where you could imagine some sort of interventions, um, that uh, that just try to keep the guns in the hands of the law-abiding citizens rather than the people who are stealing them. Um, but uh, otherwise, this is just, you know, it's a much bigger conversation. Surely if we implemented really meaningful gun control, um, I think the best evidence shows that that would dramatically reduce violent crime. Um, there is uncertainty there, of course. Uh, these studies aren't perfect. We don't randomly pass these laws. They're really contentious. We could have a much longer conversation about the literature there. But um, but I think in my mind, the big question is whether we're actually going to do it. And it seems very unlikely to me. So I don't spend a whole lot of time talking sure. about it. So the, the economic case is clear, but the political well uh, is not. In some ways, that's a little bit like um, a carbon tax, although carbon tax is probably more contested. Um, most economists, I think some ridiculous number, like 80 or 90% of economists think carbon tax is the answer. We do that, yeah. we price the externality. <laughs> What's the problem, people? And then all of the uh, political economy people are going, well, you know, in a democracy, it doesn't quite work like this. So um, <laughs> that's another, another example, but it, it's quite interesting on that. Um, mm -hmm. I guess uh, we mentioned guns. I, I guess the other two big ones on there um, are kind of drugs and poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, with some of these intersections. Um, I was really interested in, in the drugs one. Um, mostly, I was reading the stats on alcohol in particular, uh, which seems mm -hmm. to be true across, well, I only looked at European nations in the US, but something like alcohol was involved in between 30 to 50% of violent crimes, 30 to 50% of murders across all of these nations, right? Whether you're yeah. Scandinavia, continental Europe, UK, or the US. Um, which was really amazing, domestic violence. So all of these, all of these violent ones. Uh, so obviously that's kind of legal drug, but then um, the second order on drugs and things. Um, so it, it seems to me that people think that the link with alcohol is, is pretty, um, pretty causal. Uh, would you agree? And I guess are there some policies that we can do or, or, or think uh, around that? Or is that again, tricky because of, of people on the other side, law abiding and, and the rights to alcohol and things like that? Yeah, no, that's um, the evidence on that is is uh, very strong. <laughs> Alcohol is really bad. <laughs> um, we, uh, yeah, occasionally some reporter will write up a story about like, imagine there was a drug that you know we knew increased violent crime by X percent, and like all of these had all these terrible outcomes, and you know we we heavily regulate or or um, make illegal all kinds of. Uh, substances that because we're worried about the criminal effect uh, and then they reveal at the end what we're talking about alcohol right which is obviously quite legal and uh, easily available um, so so there are study there are policies out there um, a lot of which are contributing or allowing these studies to figure out what's the effect of alcohol and crime um, taxing alcohol uh, so increasing alcohol taxes tends to reduce violent crime um, Something I've been really interested in, most of my own work is on how to help people reintegrate into society after uh, a conviction or um, or time in prison. So I spend a lot of time thinking about the kind of reducing recidivism piece. Um, and there are um, a bunch of studies of this program called 24-7 Sobriety, uh, which was started in South Dakota uh, and now expanding to some other states, where they frame it as basically like, if you are engaged in crime that is alcohol involved, you essentially lose your license to drink. And so you have to, um, as part of this program, you have to basically come into the local jail and uh, and breathe into a breathalyzer at random several times a week, or actually wear one of those uh, bracelets that measures your your blood alcohol content. Um, uh, and and the idea is if you are caught drinking, um, then you are immediately put in jail for a night or two. So it's sort of like 
in, like basically 100% certainty of getting caught if you if you drink, um, but a very light sentence or a very light consequence. And basically, they you know dramatically reduce the amount of drinking that people are doing. Um, and also, this is most most of these policies are targeted at people who have um, uh, DUIs or drinking under the influence um, or driving under the influence uh, offenses. And but they they also see reductions in like domestic violence and they actually see reductions in mortality down the road and so it just has big benefits um but uh yeah i mean if if i think i think as you said like one if if our if we were thinking we could just like ban uh drinking in general in order to reduce crime i think that's a political non-starter um lots of people see lots of benefits uh to drinking um and enjoy it um and i think but I think it does raise questions of if we trust people for the most part to do this responsibly, perhaps we could trust people to do other things responsibly uh, and then punish the violations of that uh, rather than banning the substance outright. Um, but finding ways to discourage it would certainly have public safety benefits. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but it's kind of interesting because um, I guess it's slightly mixed, but I, I tend to read that a lot of people think the, the war on drugs, though, hasn't been particularly helpful, or at least I've had pros and cons. So mm -hmm. strangely, the, the alcohol thing, oh, we kind of agree on that. But then on these other ones, um, the side effects of the war, driving crime or into the black markets and things for, with an economist mindset, again, not sure it's politically palatable. Um, yeah. But that seems to have gone the other way. Uh, is that also your, your kind of your reading? Or is it a little bit more um, contended, I guess? With the war on drugs yeah with the war on Just, drugs yeah yeah i mean i mean obviously we're in, in the us we're in the middle of a big experiment about legalizing marijuana uh, which is the easiest of them to uh the easiest of the drugs to legalize um i in general yes my read is that the war on drugs has not been particularly successful has created black markets has you know has uh increased crime in other ways all of that said a lot of there are a lot of drugs that do have really negative externalities in econ terms. Uh, you know, you, if 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 using substances only affected you, then perhaps we'd all be okay with everybody just making their own decisions if we assume you have full information and everything else. Um, but knowing that a lot of drug use uh, does have the uh, possibility of really negatively harming people around you, um, as we just discussed, alcohol does, uh, then there's an incentive for the government to regulate it, right? And so the question is just what that regulation looks like is complete criminalization and, you know, throwing the book at you and putting you in prison for a long time. Is that the best way to handle it? Eh, probably not. Uh, but uh, so, so I think in general, we're in the middle of sort of finding a middle ground and finding ways to back off this, like, uh, you know, thinking that we can just convict and incarcerate our way out of people using drugs, um, but we haven't found the best solution yet. Sure. Um, so there's going to be a lot of good uh, natural design experiments coming up now with all Let's of the Let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, which is a good segue into, um, I think one of the papers I read um, on your work, or it might've been your work sort of looking at this, uh, which was looking at uh, misdemeanors and particularly mm -hmm. sort of small offenses and whether, um, you um how harshly you come under judgment and and things like that um and the work kind of basically suggested i'm going to say it in real lay terms but if you were kind of given um strong warnings for sort of small offenses and you weren't put into the system uh the chances are uh, it was better for you uh in terms of then not getting into system or or reoffending and that type of thing and so that's um one possible uh policy um that could work and actually there seemed to be um, some natural experiments would support that and would also help uh, sort of the fact that prisons are really expensive. So um, that yeah. type of thing. Um, is that a true reading and how certain do you still feel of that uh, idea and that work now? Yeah, I think there's there's growing evidence that, you know, we've been, especially in the U.S., again, very concerned for a long time about mass incarceration and the effect that really long prison sentences have on people and, and communities and um, and this idea that, you know, locking people up is, is then makes it really difficult for them to get a job later and everything else. Um, and there's more and more evidence that really seems to show it's not the incarceration that seems to be doing most of the damage. It's the, it's the initial conviction. So if you put anything on someone's criminal record, uh, that initial misdemeanor, even an arrest, honestly, can often show up. But let's just imagine here for, uh, for the sake of argument, it's a misdemeanor conviction, a felony conviction. A lot of people who are convicted of these crimes never go to prison. 
um, but still have a very difficult time then finding a job, keeping a job if they had one, finding housing. Um, these records are permanent there. It's public record that you have this kind of record, um, probably for good reason. We don't want the government to be able to just convict and incarcerate whoever without telling us. Uh, but, but this all means that once someone giving someone a criminal record, um, is, is really costly over the long term. And so we just, I, I think the evidence in general, my read of it is that we should be, uh, we've gone too far <laughs> basically in, in how we give out, how easily and quickly we give out criminal records and we should be erring toward leniency, especially for first time offenders. So that, that research you mentioned with Amanda Egan and Anna Harvey, um, and we were working with, uh, Suffolk County uh, in Massachusetts, where Boston's located. And yeah, we basically had a, a really nice natural experiment where nonviolent misdemeanor cases, stuff like disorderly conduct and minor drug possession and shoplifting are essentially randomly assigned to different district attorneys who decide in this, in this first court hearing whether to just drop the case, it's not worth the government's time, or to move it forward and let an, a colleague kind of take it and pursue it. We found that if you get lucky and get one of these lenient prosecutors that drops the case, you're 50, 50 50% less likely to show up back in court again with a new charge. So it actually dramatically reduces recidivism. There's other work showing something similar with felony defendants. If you kind of put them on probation and then wipe the charges off, if they successfully complete probation, similarly, about 50% are less likely to come back. Um, and so this all just, uh, the way I often describe it to people is like, especially these first time offenders, when they, when they come into court, they're really at a fork in the road and you can either give them a conviction and pull them into the system, or you can just send them on their way and hope that sort of this initial contact was enough of a wake up call and they won't, and they'll kind of figure it out themselves. And it turns out for a lot of people, they would, that that is enough of a, a wake up call and they would course correct without the conviction and punishment um, that the court system would, would implement. And so you know, knowing that, that just all strikes me as meaning that like we are currently over convicting um, and over prosecuting and we should just like pull back a little bit <laughs> and let people, let people course correct on their own. Doesn't mean no punishment, right? Doesn't mean like don't ever like decriminalize these offenses or don't arrest them, but we don't need to be convicting people and throwing the book at people for everything first time offences, particularly more minor offences, although even yeah. felonies. And it, it does seem to be true, out, you know, outside of the US as well. And um, what I like about what I was reading is, like you say, it's replicated across a different couple of, of areas. Mm -hmm. The numbers are also quite big. It's not one of those where you've yeah. got just a five or 10 percent could be yeah. kind of within forecast error. Um, so essentially replicated. And also the causal um, model just really rings true if you interview or I, interviews I've read you know there are some people yes there will obviously be some bad apples or not but some people mm -hmm. say yeah this was a wake-up call you know I changed my life this was not the person I wanted to be uh, yeah. so it makes a lot of sense do you think my view generally is that I, I find policymakers tend to be open to economists there, there might be political straight constraints which means it's, it's not practical um, do you feel this is something that policymakers have, have potentially been able to pick up and maybe the politics of, of wanting to be seen to be hard on crime means that it's not possible or you, there's been a little bit of take up? I mean, where do we where do you think we are with this policy? Yeah, I so one of my favorite things about working on criminal justice policy broadly is that there's just really broad bipartisan cons consensus that our current criminal justice system is not working very well. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, incarceration rates are too high. It is helps that incarcerate, it, that is, it's helpful here that incarceration is so expensive. So even if it's just like small government conservatives are worried about spending lots of money on a field program, incarceration is a great example. Um, so that means that there are just, there are a huge number of people of all political stripes that are interested in what the evidence says about how to how to fix things. Um, and on most of these topics, there isn't a left and right policy yet. <laughs> so, so uh, and that's probably because most of this is, is state and local and the federal government doesn't get involved as much. Um, so it becomes less of a, less fodder for cable news, um, which is great. Um, I think, you know, all of that said, one challenge in the current conversation about, uh, you know, whether prosecutors should be airing to our leniency is in the U.S. We've been having this conversation about progressive prosecutors, and they're and so they've been they've been the ones really pushing policies like this, um, and uh, this is 
most, a lot of them have been elected around the same time that the pandemic happened and you see this increase in homicides. And so it's become a very hot political issue whether these pro progressive prosecutor policies are what are causing the rise in homicide. My read of the evidence is that that is absolutely not happening. Um, but, you know, there are variations in policies across places. Maybe there are some places where it contributed, who knows. Um, but it is at least an easy story to tell. So I think that is sort of a one short term blip in this in this conversation about could we go easier on on defendants, especially first time defendants. Um, but uh, but I'm quite confident that over the longer term, um, it'll get a lot of traction. And I think there are, there are just there are a lot of policymakers in the space that honestly just are trying to figure out how to make things work well. And their courts are overwhelmed and crime rates are are always a concern. And so if they can get a, if they have a policy that, you know, that is this effective. Um, and again, we're, we're talking here about just like airing more toward leniency. It's not like everybody gets one crime free or something, right? It's not, it's not a totally guarantee of leniency. Um, uh, and it's I cheap. Think, I think, and it's cheap, exactly. It's <laughs> cheaper than the status quo and you get less crime. It just, it feels like this should be an easy sell. Um, and so, so everyone I talk to like gets it, you know, and it seems, seems intuitive. Um, and, and I suspect these sorts of changes are happening. They're just a little bit, they're not advertising them in <laughs> there. It's, it's not the sort of thing you want to get into a fight on cable news about. Um, but I suspect um, a lot of offices are, I think a lot of offices are paying attention to the evidence and, and uh, using it accordingly. Sure, that makes sense. That also um, brings to mind the question that Tyler Cowan asked, and I think you kind of part answered, which was with this recent uptick um, in crimes, um, does this mean the end for criminal justice reform? And I think your answer was, well, it's a blip, but hopefully over the longer term, actually, because we don't quite understand why there's this uptake, but we do know things which would make it go back down regardless, um, mm -hmm. we should still be pressing ahead. Um, but yeah, that's his question is, this is mean a criminal justice reform is, is harder or has it, has it even um, kind of uh, stopped making any headway? Um, I know that a lot of people, especially early in the pandemic when we saw homicide first start to rise, a lot of people in policy circles were really freaking out about this, <laughs> that this was going to be the end of the criminal justice reform movement. That they, the, the idea being that you know, a lot of people are very open to the idea of reform uh, when they feel safe. But as soon as they feel like their personal safety is threatened or the safety of their kids or their friends is threatened, then forget it, lock everybody up, right? Um, so I think this, this just requires um, uh, us to be more deliberate I think in our it's it's, it's going to be it's going to be a harder conversation um, and and already is a somewhat harder conversation. I think um, something that I have noticed is that often you see almost like the the right left divide almost becomes like the left only wants to focus on the fact that the criminal justice system can be very unfair and inefficient and racially biased, but they don't want to acknowledge that there's a real public safety problem. And then the right. Uh, it's only focused on rising homicide rates and doesn't want to acknowledge the inefficiencies and inequities in the, in the system. And obviously, like both of these things are problems. <laughs> like we we can fix the system and make it more efficient and more fair and lower crime and make people safer. And it seems like we have to do both of those things. Um, but it's it's um, it has been interesting, I think, the political dialogue around like whether we acknowledge that crime is increasing uh, has seemed a bit contentious. And I think part of it is because there are some folks that worry that if we acknowledge that homicide is increasing and that there are cities that are less safe now than they were four or five years ago, then somehow people won't be supportive of reform anymore. And I, my personal view is you just have to, you have to acknowledge the facts on the ground uh, in order to have a productive conversation. Yeah, I call it the kind of uh, walk and chew gum problem you, you, you definitely yeah. can do both. And you, and you, and you, you yeah, do both. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I am, that, that, I exactly. am optimistic. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's a little bit harder <laughs> yeah. than walking a chew gum, but that. Actually, we yeah. have the same arguments here in the UK on our um, health system, where it's obvious if mm -hmm. you don't really tackle it from a left-right perspective, that uh, it actually needs 
more money and more investment and it needs to be more efficient those two things are actually both true it's it's really inefficient yes. and I guess yeah. generally the right leaning would say oh but we've got to make it more efficient we're wasting money and all of that which is true but it also needs capital investment it needs investment in human capital all of this yeah. so it needs more money as well and you can walk into yeah. them and you need to do both if you're gonna if you're gonna do that and, and actually probably most things um are like that um so maybe yeah, thinking totally. about it I do think to just yeah, one other one other quick thought on that. I mean, I think, you know, one thing that um, I do hope that we've learned from this experience in the 90s, right, where we saw we saw a big uptick in, in violent crime then and we responded by putting everyone in prison for a really long time uh, and just, you know, basically I mean, mass incarceration was our response. Um, and uh, and and we've learned since that that's not a cost effective policy. Um, so so prison and uh, jail and prison can keep actively dangerous people off the streets for a certain period of time. That is genuinely helpful, right? Um, but it has zero uh, or close to zero deterrent effect on long-term behavior. People do not respond to the knowledge of a long sentence. They respond to the probability of getting caught. And so, you know, we've learned, this is all to say we've learned a lot since the 90s <laughs> about what works and what doesn't. And so my hope is genuinely that this time around, if, I mean, already it seems like crime rates are leveling off, so maybe hopefully we don't get into this kind of situation, but if crime were to continue to rise and it continues to be a major public policy issue, my genuine hope is that we will respond smarter this time and actually use everything we learned over the past several decades to, to do this better um, and, and uh, yeah, achieve more public safety in a, in a smarter, more cost-effective, more fair way. You know, I'm hopeful. I'm I'm always a kind of cautiously optimistic person, though, uh, on a lot of these things. <laughs> Same. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe thinking about some of these other win-wins or the intersectionality. I, I mentioned healthcare because um, I think it was in a couple of your review articles that access to healthcare helps reduce crime. And actually, I do a lot of work in mm -hmm. health. And this is one of the things I think people really miss is this intersection. There's a lot of intersection with social care and, and all of these other things. But I'm saying, well, yes, access to health care will help life expectancy if you want your health KPIs. But you get a lot of these other side benefits. And the, the one, particularly in poor areas, and particularly now with the mental health one, on crime mm -hmm. seems to be absolutely massive. And particularly if you then try and put it in dollar terms, you're getting huge returns to the system, which don't go into the standard health economic ones because they're not interdisciplinary enough, which is one of my yeah. real bugbears around how specialized um, most economists have, have gone. I said, well, you make this health economy argument, but you, you've missed two or three of the really big wins, which is if your crime goes down and then you try and put a value on that, you've, you've just blown out 10 times. So I was wondering yeah. how strong do you think that access to healthcare kind of element uh, still is? Uh, maybe you talk about that and the, and you, um, uh, the the three other ones, um, if you wanted to comment them as well, which I thought were really interesting, were improving neighborhoods uh, because people mm -hmm. like nice streets. It tends to be a win for the community. Seems to also reduce crime. Um, a little bit more niche, but these ones on summer jobs, and then also for certain mm -hmm. people, are kind of essentially uh, cognitive behavior therapy, but but therapy mm -hmm. for people who 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 could spiral downwards again. Relatively cheap interventions seems to be win wins. Um, be interested in yeah. how you reflect on that sort of literature and, and that intersectionality of these, I guess these are kind of non-police other win-win ways of reducing crime, which kind of seem to work. And I kind of feel that there would be, or there is support for, I, am, I, am I right here? Yeah, I spend a lot of my time talking about interventions like this when I talk to policymakers who are, you know, I, I basically, when I get invited to talk now, now it's all about how to reduce violent crime. And I'll start with the criminal justice interventions because like we do know some stuff works, like putting more police on the streets works, putting cameras everywhere works, right? Stuff like that. But if for whatever reason you want to know about what else you could do, there's a lot of other stuff you could do. Uh, and so healthcare is, I think, the one I've become most bullish on. Um, there are a lot of really nice studies now showing that increasing access to healthcare through programs like Medicaid, uh, which, which uh, is available to um, lower income residents in the U.S., um, so there have been recent expansions that are have especially uh, expanded Medicaid to uh, low-income uh, childless men, uh, which is exactly the group that you might worry would be engaged in crime. And um, and those all show uh, big reductions in crime rates. 
Um, and the exact channel is still a little up in the air. It could be an increase in mental health care. It could be an increase in substance use treatment. Of course, those things can heavily interact uh, and intersect. Um, it could be the re just reduction in like financial stress uh, that that might lead to more drinking or something like that. Um, so, so people are still working out the exact mechanisms, uh, but there's this one amazing paper um, by Elisa Yakame where she has data from South Carolina on who's on Medicaid as kids, and then sees like basically if you if you have Medicaid as a kid, um, it's just much easier to be on Medicaid as a child than once you're an adult. They kick off most people at age 19, and so she can see what happens to everyone at age 19, and she just sees this like at age 19 for young men that are kicked off. Uh, suddenly just like a huge increase in incarceration rates, almost like immediate. You can see it in the graph. They're all just locked up. <laughs> and that is driven entirely or almost entirely by uh, by young men who were having medication for mental health, for mental health uh, issues covered by Medicaid. And so basically they lose that medication and almost immediately are locked up uh, in our criminal justice system. And it's just like, God, what a waste of money of time of you know you know this is such a burden on these kids um it's just such a cheap intervention um when you think about it that way healthcare um so so there's more and more evidence coming out like that uh i talk to some people sometimes and they're like yeah i mean anyone who looks at the system and has any interaction with this population knows immediately healthcare matters uh and i always like to say but now we have the research you know <laughs> so it's, it's useful like not everything that seems obvious to us when we look at it firsthand actually is borne out by the data this one is um and so there's just there's more and more really strong causal evidence that increasing access to, to health care um, reduces crime and reduces recidivism. Um, uh, I kind of put cognitive behavioral therapy in a similar bucket, although there it's it's obviously CBT can be useful for people that don't have what we traditionally diagnose as a mental illness. Um, but the story around CBT and the kinds of programs that have been tested are more around like changing the scripts that we all have in our heads about how social interactions will go. And that is perhaps more beneficial to people who live in neighborhoods where you have to interact with some people in some way and then sort of like change your interactions to interact with other people. So for those of us that, you know, live in like safe, affluent neighborhoods, you know, you sort of like defer to authority or if anybody like pushes, you know, gives you a hard time, you sort of, you know, if someone mugging you on the street, you hand over your wallet and like know that like there'll be a cop around the corner. If a cop tells you uh, or pushes back on you and tells you to to do what you're told, you do it. Um, but kids that are growing up in in higher crime neighborhoods might learn over time that they they need to kind of stand up for themselves and push back if they're threatened in the neighborhood because that's the only way they survive. And then, of course, if they do the same thing with a cop, uh, there could be terrible consequences. And so, so when you have to do that sort of like script shifting across different places, that very, that is just much more cognitively taxing. And so the CBT programs basically push everybody to just slow down and think about what is the story you have in your mind about how this interaction is going to go and just make a more deliberate choice about how you're going to respond um, and, and don't respond and so with sort of your immediate impulse. Um, and so uh, I hope I didn't butcher that program too much to anyone who's listening that studies these programs intensely, but I think that's the general idea. And they've been shown to be really effective when they're when they're introduced with kids in schools, um, high risk kids in schools, and and even tested in like juvenile detention centers. They see, you see big reductions in recidivism going forward. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I often joke with folks that like if we just gave everyone a therapist, I mean, truly like everyone a therapist, I think we'd all be better off and we'd see a lot of social returns. But especially if you give um, people that are at higher risk for mental illness and uh, and for, you know, emotional trauma that comes from violence and living in rough neighborhoods and everything else. If we gave all of them a therapist, I think we'd see big reductions in, in crime and other sorts of uh, social ills. So, so it seems like a really good investment. That's one of my left field ideas for um, AI therapy. I think there's some evidence that AI mm -hmm. chatbots are okay. They're not as good as an in-person therapist, but they're better than yeah. nothing, at least for overall therapy. So mm -hmm. obviously not proved here. So if they become very cheap and everyone has them on their phone and there's a little bit of a push, then yeah. maybe they can give us the, the positive stories that that we need. Um, the last one on that was yeah. the improving neighborhoods. Is that is that strong mm -hmm. on built-in environment? Are you positive on that one as well? 
Yeah, I think uh, there's some, I would say in general, there's some like suggestive evidence on this. I think, again, the channel here is a little unclear. I, yeah. I saw something recently saying that maybe part of it could be that like police send more, spend more time in, in nicer neighborhoods uh, or would yeah. be like green vacant lots or whatever. So it's actually the police presence that's doing this. Uh, so I think we still need to figure this out, but um, but there are some neat studies. There's one where uh, they looked at neighborhoods where like there was some sort of moth or something that was like eating all the leaves on the trees and killing the tree of uh, trees of certain types, but not other types. And then they so it was like this random shock to where the trees were, <laughs> and they saw what happened to violent crime in the places where these like moth susceptible trees to the ones that that were were okay, um, and uh, uh, and they saw crime go up in the places where the trees all died, um, and so it's sort of like these neat, <laughs> it's like oh well, so so it could be the tree, uh, even there I mean there we also have evidence that like increasing temperatures increases crime and increasing or increasing pollution or reducing air quality um, seems to increase crime. Um, and so so it could be trees also help with air quality. They help cool everything down. There's shade, right? So is it really the greenery or is it the shade or is it the better air quality? Or is it the cops who like to hang out where there are nice trees? Like who knows? Um, but there is there is a good amount of evidence on this. Um, and there are a whole bunch of criminologists in particular that are really interested in just the connection between our built environment um, and, and how we behave in that environment. And so there are other psychological mechanisms that are potentially at play and that like we just behave better in, in certain types of places than others. Yeah, that, that definitely does seem to be a link with the built environment. But as you say, it, it's complex and actually may not even hold from one location to another location, even with the kind of same physical makeup. The one I see here uh, in London, although I think they might have run out of money because I don't see it as much so often, but we have um, uh, fly tip zones. Do you call them the same thing in the States where people dump their rubbish and are not meant to dump them there? Uh, oh, okay. so that you occasionally get these hotspot places where there's there's just people just dump all of their old fridges mm -hmm. or toys and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously they're often uh, not very, not, the office ugly corners of the street anyway yeah and uh local councils did efforts like they cleared them up and then you they dumped them again but then they cleared them up and then they <laughs> planted plants and made it look really nice ah, uh -huh. and then actually people decided not to fly tip there anymore because it's kind of like oh we wouldn't spoil it uh I think maybe it just moved it to other places. So I'm not sure, like, <laughs> but at least those zones right. were no longer. But it improved uh, like that it. neighborhood. But right. it improved that neighborhood. Right. And maybe I think the idea of, yeah. like, at least in, in that, then if it's then you have to go so far enough that you can't fly tip on your street, then you do what you're meant to do, which is just call up the local council and then they come and take it away. Right. But, it, you know, it's, it increases the little... cost of the alternative. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That's exactly, that's yeah. exactly right. Um, yeah, I know. I mean, this is some in some ways the the uh, a bit of a theory behind broken windows, which is which was really hot in the '90s. Which is this idea that like if we um, uh, if if we really crack down on low level offenses and sort of quality of life offenses like littering or, or dumping your trash on a street corner or or um, uh, or breaking windows, <laughs> right? Which is where the name came from. Um, then everybody sort of notices that this neighborhood is now being cared for and people are paying attention to it. And so then they will uh, stop behaving in criminal ways. Um, and so this again was hot in the nineties. A lot of people thought that implementation of these broken window strategies and policing was a reason that crime declined so much in the nineties. We now know it doesn't seem to have contributed, uh, doesn't seem to explain why crimes fell so much in places like New York, uh, where it was especially important. Um, but but this, this basic idea that like, if you take care of a place um, and lots of people seem to be paying attention and there's like a neighborhood watch or something like that, um, then it does seem intuitive that people are gonna be less likely to, uh, to, um, yeah, to do things that that would disrupt that place, right? And so um, might generally be deterred from committing crime in that place if they feel like being, or people are paying attention to it. The question is how to actually like implement that. It doesn't mean we need to, you know, arrest everybody and throw them in prison for 10 years. Uh, it can mean low, lower level consequences, um, or it could mean just like 
plant some flowers <laughs> that can deter people from dumping their trash there, right? There might be other ways. Um, but uh, but I think the basic point is that sometimes these low level investments can have big payoffs. Yeah. And I think, like you say, it's probably an intersection of a few things. So community policing or being aware in your community and your neighborhood mm -hmm. being good, more aware, police more likely to be yeah. walking on the beat um, uh, and mm -hmm. all of those um, other types of things. Um, I was interested in your views on what alternatives to jail um, uh, else we could do. So like you said, um, there's kind of just letting people off for minor misdemeanors, but there's, there seems to be some evidence that some of these other alternatives to jail also work in a kind of win-win because jail is really expensive. Yeah, so I've become really interested in um, electronic monitoring as an alternative to especially short jail and prison sentences. So uh, in the US, we often use electronic monitoring as like a supplement to like a supplement to community supervision. So if we're going to let you out pre-trial or we're going to let you put you on probation, then maybe we'll add uh, electronic monitoring so we can keep track of where you are and we'll get notified if you leave your house and you're not supposed to. Um, and that, you know, increasing supervision doesn't seem as helpful. Um, but as an alternative to locking you up, we now have a lot of evidence from other countries that do this routinely, uh, that it's really beneficial and seems to reduce recidivism quite dramatically. Uh, and some of that seems to come from reducing the, dis the disruption that prison can have, that jail and prison can have. You see you're able to continue working, continue spending time with your family, maybe going to school. Um, it also can reduce the, um, the negative effects you might get from spending time in prison with other people that are criminally active, right? And so, so those sort of negative peer effects can be reduced if, if we just uh, put you on electronic monitoring and send you home. Um, and so there's one recent paper that just came out from someone who's on the economics job market this year, Rowan Rivera, and he seemed, he's finding similar effects in the U.S. Um, that using electronic monitoring as a substitute for incarceration seems beneficial. Um, and so that's the first evidence we have in the US, uh, which is a major holdup with policymakers because everyone's like, well, we're not Australia, we're not the UK, we're not France. Uh, so it's totally different here. Uh, it turns out it's not totally different. It works the same way here. <laughs> um, and so, so that's really promising. And it feels to me like, um, you know, for various reasons, we might not want to just let everyone that we're current send, currently sending to prison out. Uh, we might not even want to put, let everyone who's on the margin of going to prison out, um, but it could at least make it like more uh, politically palatable to reduce our reliance on incarceration um, and has the big benefit of actually dramatically reducing recidivism. And like we were talking about earlier, it's also cheaper than sending someone to prison. Yeah. So there are a variety of reasons that this could shift us in a better direction. Um, and is something that, yeah, I'm paying a lot of attention to this research space. Yeah, so that's all of your work on sort of technology and, and justice and, and crime. And those mm -hmm. arguments from policymakers actually really irritate me sometimes because sometimes it's clear. So, you know, if you've got differences in countries like America with guns and Europe, okay, there might yeah. be differences. But when the causal model you have is, well, yeah. <laughs> it's the same kind of human and the same kind of thing, it's kind totally. of really silly to, to, to do that. It's like you're putting it, back there's there's a reason that there's dissimilarities and if you ask the experts they will generally agree when they think there's read through or when they think there's not read through and they're mm -hmm. also generally right as well that's the other thing if you, you do the research and say if you if you were to guess in advance do you think this will replicate or not replicate uh, yeah. these things um actually economists generally get it right which is also um kind of unsurprising there um yeah maybe we should touch a little bit on also um what doesn't work um I recall you said earlier um, cameras can work, but I think you were referring to kind of CCTV cameras and cameras mm -hmm. on the street, which we have mm -hmm. a lot of in London. Actually, we might yeah. have reached oversaturation because once you have one on every block, maybe three on every block is not going to do you any any further, <laughs> but one on a block versus not. Whereas yeah. I think your work suggests or we've looked at that body cameras, long story short, uh, kind of probably don't work and are also quite expensive. And another thing which may be doesn't work or is a little bit more mixed um, and this is kind of on the flip side is um, when you're kind of applying for jobs and you're kind of now what is it when you're resume blind so you, you don't have to say things about oh, ban the box policy yeah ban the, the box that's chance. it yes yeah mm -hmm. oh I uh, yeah forgot the buzzy buzzword on that <laughs> uh, which is which is kind of interesting because you, you you would have thought that oh maybe not but the, the second order effects which might be the same with 
uh, with the body cams, which I thought was quite interesting. Mm. And maybe in the third one, which also seems to be a little bit more contested, uh, was on um, uh, alternative sort of drug use for sort of naxalones and methylodones and things like that, whether there's mm. kind of any displacement on, on that. So I'd be interested in, in your views on some of the things which actually maybe second order when we've, we've looked at them in, in more controlled cases uh, may not seem to have worked how we, we thought or are either contested or neutral or, or you kind of think actually they, they might not be worth the money. And th those were the kind of three I picked up on in, in your work. Yeah, so uh, I'm talking, yeah, I'm talking a lot here about like what works, what have we learned? Uh, the, the drum I usually am beating with policymakers is these are really hard problems to solve most things we try will not work. We should aim to fail fast, not, not to fail, because the reality is most things we try are not going to have the effects that we are hoping for. Um, and often they're gonna backfire. And so just because these are such complex situations and human behavior is really hard to predict a lot of the time. So um, yeah, so these are great examples, <laughs> those sorts of situations. So yeah, cameras in general, like CCTV cameras, um, seem to be really beneficial because they're increasing the probability that you get caught. And again, that, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of evidence now that increasing the probability you get caught has a much bigger deterrent effect than increasing the punishment. And so uh, they have a privacy cost. And so that becomes, that needs to be our, pub our public conversation. Like different types of surveillance technologies are going to have bigger benefits than others and also bigger costs than others. And so you know, weighing those things becomes the becomes the conversation we should have, but we should know that in general, they're gonna be more effective than putting people in prison for 20 years. Um, uh, the body-worn camera literature is actually really interesting because there were all of these really nice randomized control trials, which is really unusual in the space. We had all these RCTs across different countries, uh, randomly give body-worn cameras to some police officers and not others. And the working hypothesis there was that if the if the officer is wearing the camera and knows their behavior is observed, they're going to be less likely to um, to allow uh, to behave badly, um, which could include like knowingly escalating a situation to an arrest or use of force when it didn't need it. Um, and so, to the extent that police are behaving badly in a conscious way, uh, rather than just because they're afraid for their safety, for instance, then body worn cameras could reduce that bad behavior. But across all these RCTs, basically we found very little evidence of any sort of benefit or any behavior change at all. Um, so that was really discouraging. Uh, that doesn't, you know, all these places kept their body worn cameras, <laughs> presumably because that's not, they weren't actually counting on that behavior change uh, as the main goal of the policy. They also just wanted transparency and they wanted to be able to hold people accountable when something bad happened, even if it was somewhat rare. So. So that was sort of the conversation for a long time, but we've since had a couple of studies come out that have made the point, you know, to the extent that RC, that, that these body-worn cameras, uh, that if some officers are wearing them and others aren't, it could still have a broader impact on the community in a way that a within community randomized control trial is not gonna pick up. So part of this is just spillovers across officers or across shifts, depending on how these things are randomized. And the studies already always talked about this, but it was hard to tell exactly how big the spillovers would be. Anyway, so there, there have been a couple of other studies that have just like looked, compared communities that adopted body-worn cameras with those that didn't and compared trends over time. And, and those seem to find big, uh, at, at least suggested evidence of big reductions in police use of force in the places that adopted body-worn cameras, which suggests that it could, these community-wide effects could be happening. This is still a very active research area, <laughs> active conversation, but it feels like maybe there's something there that we didn't see with the RCTs, which is just fascinating from a research perspective because we usually love RCTs as like the best gold standard evidence. Yeah. Um, no design is perfect. No design, no design is perfect. You learn different things from different designs. Yeah. And it can't Absolutely. capture everything, right? Exactly, yeah. Interesting, so, um, still, so the jury's still out. The jury is suddenly still out. It's back out. <laughs> back the out. jury was in for a while and now it's back out because of this new evidence, which is just, you know, science, man. Like, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, on Ban the Box, yes, this is an area I've studied directly. Uh, so basically the idea behind Ban the Box is that uh, we 
are worried that a lot of people with criminal records cannot get their foot in the door um, to get a job interview or, or to be considered for a job because employers see like they'll have a box on the application saying, have you ever been convicted of a crime? If you check yes on that box, anecdotally, we know that employers just like will often just throw those applications out. Uh, we also just have a bunch of really nice experimental research um, or people send fictitious resumes from different people with the box checked or not. We know employers discriminate against people with criminal records. So there's good evidence on that. Uh, the hope was that we could stop that discrimination by just removing that box. So banning the box, right? Um, but this, of course, uh, prompts economists like me to say, well, then what will they do next without the box? Why is it that they were discriminating in the first place, right? And if they're really... If they're worried about, for whatever reason, an employer doesn't want to hire someone with a criminal record, removing that information doesn't remove that worry. For whatever reason, you know, they're still they still don't want to hire someone with a criminal record. You haven't changed that. Now you've just left them in a position where they have to guess who has a criminal record. And the United States, there are huge racial disparities and who has a criminal record, and so uh, it would be statistically accurate <laughs> for them to assume that young black men are more likely to have a recent conviction they might be worried about than young white men, for instance. And so this kind of policy could increase racial disparities in employment rather than reduce them. And indeed, we had previous studies showing that like when employers first got access to criminal records, like in the 90s when uh, the internet became more widely available, uh, we actually saw reductions in racial disparities, reduced racial disparities in employment because it seems employers were racial dis racially discriminating before because they're worried about hiring people with criminal records and not because of race itself. And so adding the box on actually was a policy remedy at the time to racial discrimination, even if it wasn't, that wasn't exactly the design, but it turned out that was a, a good intervention. So now we remove the box uh, and we actually see big increases, uh, this is what I find in my study, big increases in racial disparities in employment for, for young black men. Um, and a bunch of other studies have shown these policies don't even help people with criminal records get jobs. So we see that young black men who don't have a record are now like their employment's falling because they can't signal they don't have a record up front. Um, but the people with a record aren't even getting the second chance that the policy had hoped it would get because eventually the employer can do a background check and reject their application then. So this, is, this policy has just been a complete disaster uh, and uh, still very popular. Um, people, I think there's there are a lot of uh, advocates who view it as just like a step in a broader movement, which can be like, I am sympathetic to that concern and the broader uh, desire to want to increase second chances for people with criminal records and want to improve reintegration, something I study a lot myself, uh, but this particular policy is not working and actually seems to be making things worse. So. Um, uh, yes, there are many other things we could be doing instead. And so I have that conversation a lot with folks. But yeah, great example of how just like well-intended policies do not always have good effects. So we need to make, be making sure we're getting, meeting the goals that we set out to meet. Um, and then on the drug front, uh, yeah, so I have a study on uh, naloxone and opioids, which is easily the most controversial paper <laughs> written, which is sort of amazing. I write a lot on race and crime, and it turns out this, this paper on just, I mean, essentially noting that, uh, you know, depending on whether you want to use the words moral hazard or risk compensation, if you make something safer uh, to do, people are going to do more of it. Uh, so basically, naloxone is this amazing drug that basically reduces or reverses overdoses of opioids. So it saves your life if you're in the in the midst of a, a, an opioid overdose. And there are these policies that just dramatically broadened access to this. So just sort of, you could you could easily get it from pharmacies, anywhere without a prescription. Um, and a lot of people thought like, great, this is just a an obvious clear win. If you're just gonna save a lot of lives, this could, you know, this could dramatically um, uh, change the opioid epidemic. An economist might like me looks at it and says, well, probably will have a lot of benefits, but could also increase risky opioid use, right? If we're gonna make something safer, people are gonna do more of it. So how much of that impact, how much of that benefit does it undo? And so I have this paper with Anita Mukherjee where it seems like, I don't know, it seems to undo a lot of the benefit. We see no net decline in deaths due to opioid overdoses. Um, 
some, uh, even though people go to the ER more with overdoses, so it seems like there's some which together suggest there's more actual risk of use. Uh, in general, our takeaway is even if, you know, we obviously want to save people's lives in the moment, but we have to recognize that this policy does not seem to be a slam dunk on its own, and we have to be uh, investing in other things like treatment or other solutions. So, um, yeah, that policy uh, has, or that paper has generated a lot of anger <laughs> from the public health community. I occasionally, it occasionally comes up for one reason or another, and the harm reduction folks uh, become uh, irate and send me lots of angry emails. Um, and so, but look, I mean, I just, I, I am also interested in saving lives. And I think the question here is just how the, what the best way is to do it. Yeah, the answer is it's complicated. Um, okay. I only spend a, I spent a few minutes on the internet. I was I was surprised at the strength of um, and uh, um, I mean they were I mean they were really rude. Um, so I, it's kind of it's kind of really interesting because uh, I I don't know why I wouldn't expect it in academia. I I kind of expect it. So my day job world is all about investments and markets. Yeah, and I kind of expect us to be rude with one another and you know we're trying to make money and obviously we think the person's <laughs> wrong because otherwise we wouldn't do that. Um, but I kind of thought with people sort of in good faith trying to do something complicated to get to the right yeah. answer. Um, but, you know, I, I get it's complicated. Humans are humans. Um, yep. So there was that. But I guess that that the strength of pushback probably sp continues to surprise you today. And then I guess. Totally. It's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, and similarly, like, I'm an economist and academic economists are not known for being warm and fuzzy and nice. Right. Like, I mean, yeah. we are all used to like heavy pushback, uh, very sharp criticism in academic seminars, but all in sort of like an intellectual it's all part of an intellectual exchange where we're just sort of like we're trying to make the ideas better we're pushing each other on the ideas and the data and if you have a disagreement you go to the data with it right and it's like well let's see let's test these different hypotheses and the pushback that i have gotten from the public health community at least this corner of it over the years um seems much more in line with the idea that like there is a, a consensus on what the right answer quote unquote is on, a, on a, a policy topic like this. And we found the quote unquote wrong answer. And so that goes against what they've been advocating for in policy circles. And so they need to come after the paper and sort of tear us down uh, as opposed to talking about like what could be wrong with the research methods or whatever, right? Like actually talking about how to make the paper better. And so I've had a lot of very frustrating conversations with people since about uh, the sort of detrimental effect that that kind of attitude within a scientific community has on the research that's done, right? You're not going to get, it's not surprising to me that you haven't seen other papers reach similar conclusions from within that community because people get the very clear message that they will be ostracized and torn apart publicly if they even suggest, if they if they ever see or find a result like this. And so, um, you know, I've got a pretty thick skin and I'm willing to work on controversial topics, but it definitely deterred me from ever writing a paper on health myself again. Um, and I'm sure it deters others from working on this area, uh, which I think is what a lot of these folks want. So I, um, yeah, look, I have, I know a lot of wonderful people who work in public health and are public health researchers and they're doing excellent work. Um, but there it does seem to be a corner of that research community that where they are more advocates than scholars. And I think that that is the segment of the community that comes after me on the internet <laughs> every year or so. Um, and it's just, it's just sort of amazing. Like I, I don't take it personally anymore. Like it's just clear that this is just something else that's going on, but it's fascinating to watch. And I'm curious to see how it evolves over time. Sure. Yeah. I've only, I saw a glance of it and obviously don't know the ins and outs, but it, it strikes me that there is, um, this is a symptom of um, wider challenge, which I see across many sectors. Um, and I think we see it within economics, I guess also with a kind of more recent Me Too phenomena or the fact that I, I have a lot of um, uh, women friends and also uh, younger female friends who find uh, economics a kind of unfriendly. Uh, they also find <laughs> this about law, investment banking, <laughs> quite a lot of other sectors. So, I mean, we can brush quite a lot of that. Um, yeah. But also amongst the social sciences, and I had this conversation uh, with economists here in the UK with Diane Coyle, who makes similar things. It, it kind of shapes also the research agenda, um, also how the diversity mm -hmm. of thought, um, and that there seem to be so many reports in the last couple of years, 
again, this is just skimming the internet, occasionally seeing things on social media or, or whatever, um, with sort of Me Too and these uh, these allegations, uh, which you seem to sit quite awkwardly. Um, I guess from your viewpoint, being a, a woman in uh, economics, but actually soon to leave um, Leaving, academia, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, what your viewpoint is, obviously everyone's just got their own personal story and, you know, this yeah. is not necessarily N equals 10,000, but N equals one. Uh, but yeah. I seem to get a lot of N equals one of women who haven't necessarily been super happy with the state of where um, uh, economics is in terms of diversity of people or thought and things like that. I'd be interested if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, so this is a topic I have thought a lot about over my career. Um, and uh, I mean, in general, I love being an economist. Uh, I love the the toolkit and the insights that economics brings to important social problems like criminal justice policy and reform. Um, being an academic and working in a university as an economist uh, can be different, <laughs> right? So then we're talking about like working within a certain industry. And there, I mean, so so first, I mean, I think there, uh, there's been a lot of talk for a long time about just the way that women um, and uh, and various racial groups are just tremendously underrepresented in in economics. Um, I think in general we have like full professors. It's around like twenty percent of what of full professors are women. It's somewhere around a third of all um, assistant professors are women. Uh, you know, maybe half is is too lofty a goal, but it'd be nicer to get closer to half. Um, and and this seems to be it seems to be worse than in other STEM fields. So a lot of times people are like, oh, well, it's just such a math based profession. Of course, many fewer women. That doesn't seem to be the holdup. There's something different about economics that does seem to make it worse. Um, there have been a bunch of really nice empirical studies recently in recent years showing that women do seem to face uh, biases in publication. Um, in, uh, in, in terms of being, you know, burdened with more service within the academy and, and all this other kind of stuff that, that reduces productivity um, or apparent productivity, even if our, our actual intellectual contributions are the same. Um, and, and like you, I've heard a lot of N equals one stories from lots of friends at this point who just have faced, you know, lots of what feels like one-off challenges and and biases and lack of recognition of their contributions um, and their their value their professional value uh, in the workplace um, and they're just really frustrated um, like I think you know at this point I'm I think solidly mid-career and <laughs> in, in, so I you know I've been a professor for 11 years and uh, and most women I know who are sort of in my general cohort are really struggling and really starting to look for other jobs. Um, and so, but they're trying to figure out what those alternatives are. I think a lot of us, you know, if you kind of spend all this time in the academy, you work so hard for tenure, it feels crazy to give tenure up. And I think I personally got to a point where uh, both both in just experiences in, in the universities, but also in this broader Econ Me Too conversation that I was, I was heavily part of um, in this past fall, um, I just got to, kind of got to a point where it uh, seemed clear to me that while tenure guarantees you a job, it doesn't guarantee you a good job. And so, so you know, it just made me more open to the possibility of giving tenure up and considering something else. And then once I did that, all of a sudden, like there are really amazing opportunities <laughs> that are available. And so, so yeah, I'm moving to Arnold Ventures. I'll be running their criminal justice program. So excited. It's such a good fit for me. I'm going to have an opportunity to really influence research and policy in this area in ways that I've already been trying to do, but it will just be, a, it'll just be so much easier to do from this other platform. Um, so very excited. It's, it's definitely uh, a move for the best. Um, and I, now I find myself when I talk to women who are like, I don't know, this is just such a terrible job. Like, I don't know, how, like I just, I've stopped just commiserating and now I'm full on encourage them to consider other options. <laughs> so I think they're out there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, there, there are all kinds of people that are really working hard with an economics to make it better. Um, and, and in general, I, you know, I still strongly encourage women to go and, you know, major in economics, even get a PhD in economics if they love research. Um, I think it's an amazing, uh, 
amazing, amazing toolkit and an amazing um, uh, source of expertise, and it allows you to have an influence um, and uh, interesting insights and all what you know wherever you want to apply it. But I'm also very glad that there are now lots of different ways that you can apply that expertise. You don't have to become a professor. Um, you can work in tech, you can work in industry. Everybody loves economists at this point and sees their, their values. So um, yeah, that's the not so short version of my <laughs> current thinking on, on economics and, and the profession. Sounds very clear. I'm gonna ask you about Arnold Ventures at the end. I, I guess mm -hmm. I had one question then on this is, um, what, what would you propose to the economics profession? Are there any policies or ideas or, or culture change? I will link it back to policing because <laughs> why not? Um, because what I've seen here, this is more of a London metropolitan police issue, which I've seen. Um, mm -hmm. But it does strike me that particularly for London, which is quite a multicultural city, having a police force which reflects your city really seems to help. So more mm -hmm. women and more minorities in the police and again, this for me is anecdotal, but I've seen some little bit in the literature and it kind of because it causally makes sense that, you know, if you're part of the black community and you see black police officers, you, you kind of feel like you're going to be listening to yeah. people in your community and you'll be listening. They'll take to you seriously. Like, take yeah. you seriously, either if you have a complaint or if you, you know, feel like you're being picked on. Oh, it's not being picked on. Hey, bro, you know, this is what's happening. You feel you're listened to. And again, mm -hmm all sorts of good reasons for having women. So I'm actually quite interestingly a, a fan of kind of, I don't know whether you necessarily get there by quotas, but diversity mm -hmm. in police force, diversity in a lot of organizations seem to have these system-wide benefits, which obviously yeah. I could see happening in, in economics. And uh, I, I wonder whether you think that's true of policing and then what what would you do for, mm -hmm. for economics? Yeah, yes, yeah, so there's definitely evidence that that's the case in policing, that having more women officers, uh, increases reporting of gender-based violence, reduces uh, homicides due to domestic violence, for instance, um, increasing the hiring of Black police officers, seems to reduce victimization of Black people in the community. Uh, so all of, you know, basically this where you laid out is supported by the data, um, uh, at least studies we have so far. And I think this is a place where seeing if this continues to hold up in current day, a lot of this was based on like litigation in the 70s and 80s. Um, sort of from baseline, but um, uh, is definitely something I think we have good reason to believe would be a really good fix for policing, or at least contribute, uh, move it in the right direction. Um, and I think the same holds in economics, right? I mean, we know that there are important role model effects. It's hard to hard to be what you can't see. <laughs> that that whole thing. Um, so so having you know more senior women encourages more more women to come into the profession. Uh, there also is evidence that just having, you know, people, people appreciate having mentors who are like them in some way. And you could imagine mentors being able to, you know, be better being, you know, women being able to be better mentors to women because they just understand their experience. And so there have been interesting papers suggesting that, um, you know, affirmative, one way affirmative action can be beneficial in the long run is that it sort of, it, it brings in a, a at least a first cohort of like senior people from this minority group. And then that has long-term benefits. Even if the affirmative action stops, they're able to mentor people further down. And so then it can kind of continue the flow of, of people from that minority in. And so you could imagine there being big benefits there. You know, I mean, econ economists in general hate quotas, but there, has been, there have been all these interesting studies showing that quotas, at least in the political space, like requiring a certain number of women to be elected from certain places, uh, they all seem to have huge benefits and it seems to be mostly crowding out more of like mediocre male candidates and it changes the way that residents think about women in leadership right now they have actually seen a woman leader and so they're less likely to think women can't lead or they're may maybe more able to like be better judges of women candidates because they now have you know a better they're they've they've seen some examples that are able to maybe they they didn't know how to tell who would be a good woman, woman leader from a bad woman leader before, but now they can, something like that. Um, so you can imagine similar stories in, in economics. I, as someone who has organized seminar series in various places that I've worked, uh, I have definitely in the past thought about, you know, I want to have, bring in um, 
more junior candidates from from underrepresented groups because I want my my senior uh, white male colleagues to think about these people as economists. You know, these are examples of what economists look like, um, and and that has been a very uh, active type of intervention I've made in the past. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, I think all of this stuff matters. And then, as you said before, I mean, there's a reason this isn't all just, you know, to make us feel good. I honestly think the science will be better if we, A, have the best and brightest people at the table. And you can't do that if a huge segment of the population either feels excluded or is actively excluded, right, and discriminated against. Um, but then also it changes the research questions that we're asking if we don't have people with all kinds of life experiences in the room. Uh, we will come up with better policy solutions. We'll come up with better hypotheses if we have a variety of perspectives there. And so this is good for science ultimately um, to, to have a wider variety of people there and to break down the different silos that are separating us currently. Um, so a lot of this is motivated just by like, I don't know, I'm just like tired of injustice. <laughs> it's just like really frustrating to see uh, my friends not valued by their colleagues. But part of it is honestly, I think this is just really important for science. And I really, I think, you know, economics is is often offering some of the best policy solutions in really important spaces. And we have seats at the table a lot more than people from other disciplines. And so if we're falling down on the job because of stuff like this, feels to me like a relatively easy fix. Yeah, better for the science, better, better for humanity. And I wasn't aware of that um political uh leadership uh work you mentioned there but makes a lot of sense to me great so i thought i would finish with a little overrated underrated and then uh future questions uh so if you're up for sure. it you can just go un overrated underrated or you can pass or or neutral um i'll start <laughs> okay. with um texas oh totally underrated I of course love it's got to be Texas right. so much i grew up in, you're, you're uh, yeah Texas i grew born? up in massachusetts oh no massachusetts I know. Grew, okay. grew up in massachusetts and have slowly been moving farther south um i like warm weather and friendly people and texas is great on both counts so i love it what's, here. what's most misunderstood about texas i think on the coasts um of the u.s it's very it's like People really enjoy making fun of Texas as being this like crazy outlier where everyone's just like politically super hard right and uh, and it's just not true. It's just you know there it's like any state there are rural areas and urban areas and uh, and also it's just it's a huge state. There are like five major cities in the state, um, so it's just a really diverse place and. Uh, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah, it's like um, it's like Nashville in Tennessee. Also, um, people mm -hmm. think of it as one thing, but it's uh, but it's more than that. Um, yeah. So, overrated or underrated? Uh, universal basic income. Oh, um, I think probably overrated. Feels like a, uh, it's getting a lot of hype, and I don't know. It's it's not a policy that I. I'm super excited about as like a panacea <laughs> <laughs> yeah that uh, seems fair to me um overrated or underrated uh dna databases oh underrated yeah i yeah. have research showing that they have a huge deterrent effect um and as i was saying before like there are gonna be some surveillance technologies where there are really big privacy costs and others where there's less this one i think people think because it's dna it's like really invasive but it's really it's it's not what you're imagining they're not like analyzing your whole genome it's really just like a higher tech fingerprint so yeah. low privacy I, costs i think they're overblown in fact i so in my health work i think this overall privacy concern is held um, mm -hmm. is holding back all of our healthcare data analytics and we mm -hmm. don't realize we give so much more information to facebook and google and apple anyway oh my gosh um, we've ticked the box totally. and given it to them uh, but, but actually, because of the rules and regulations, we've held on to healthcare. But actually, the healthcare would really help us out. And the data to Google only allows them to sell you more widgets and shoes. So it's, it's actually, it's, we've, we've got it yes. backwards. It is, it is more targeted shoes. So it's the shoes that you want. So there is maybe a little bit yeah. of consumer welfare for it, but it's not the same in health. Uh, we've definitely got that the wrong way yeah. around. But anyway, yeah. And it's through the same channel that. Agreed. Um, 
uh, like the CCTV is because your uh, probability of getting caught it puts you off. In exactly. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, overrated or underrated at daylight savings time? <laughs> written on my papers here. Uh, I think underrated. So from a crime perspective, it turns out shifting daylight to the evening, which is what daylight saving time does, uh, reduces crime because people are more likely to get caught when the sun is out. Yeah. So I only learned that this this week. So a lot of people don't seem to like daylight savings time, but um, I haven't heard this angle. So actually, when you put into the crime yeah. effects, it actually, um, uh, yeah, seemed to be more robust to a slightly bigger, uh, slightly yeah. bigger number um that i thought yeah well people often think of saving time as the switching but it's yeah. actually like daylight saving time is like the summer when sunlight's in the evening and then standard time is when the sunlight is in the morning and we could actually we could eliminate the switching and just keep daylight saving time year round and so people occasionally propose this in congress and and so the fight so you could imagine like three different fights you want to have do you want the switching and all the costs that people worry about seem to come from the switching of time, of the time change. So like you don't get as much sleep and like there are more heart attacks and car accidents and all this stuff because people are thrown off, but we could do away with the switching and just keep daylight saving time in terms of when we want our daylight. So you get one step up and, and that's because more crime happens at night. Is that right? Or in dark? More crime or happens at night, right. If it does happen at night, right. And is yeah, that because so it's imagine... actually... Is it actually easier to do crime at night or is it just perceived to be from the stories we tell ourselves? So that's why we do it. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I usually quip that like just criminals aren't warning people. Uh, right. So they're just not getting, you know, they're not getting up to rob you at 6 a.m. on your, or 7 a.m. on your commute. They're they're only going to rob you at 5 p.m. on your commute. There might actually be more people out and about at 5 p.m. Yeah, too. Um, and you might be more, more likely to walk home than, uh, than walk to work. But uh yeah, for whatever reason, there's a lot more crime in the evening. And so shifting the daylight then is does actually reduce crime overall. It doesn't just get shifted to the morning. Sure. Um, and the last one on this, um, the links between, I guess, climate and crime, although I guess this might be more specifically heat. Uh huh. Yeah. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so we have all of this evidence that higher temperatures uh, increase crime. Um, and yeah, I have, I have work with Jonathan Colmer showing that that also intersects with gun laws, <laughs> going back to the first part of our conversation, uh, and gun laws are very effective at mitigating this, this heat, uh, crime intersection. Um, but this all matters because climate change is happening and our temp, our temperatures are rising. And, um, so we should expect violent crime to rise too, and all of these anti-violence programs are only going to be more important as temperatures go up more. That makes a lot of sense. Great. Um, so last couple of questions. Um, how about your future work and ventures? So what's on your agenda for your work with Arnold Ventures and what's um, all of the other things you're getting up to? <laughs> that's the main one right now. Uh, so yeah, I'll be the executive vice president for criminal justice at Arnold Ventures starting in July. Um, which means I'm overseeing their research and advocacy funding and strategies. Um, and in general, what is really attractive to me about Arnold and what's drawn me to them, uh, why I think I'm a good match, is they are very focused on, um, on rigorous research uh, informing policy and not only trying to support and generate more of that really high quality causal research, but also getting it into the hands of policymakers and having a uh, making sure that it's having an impact, um, and so um, so yeah, I'll be doing a lot of that. I will keep the podcast going. I have a lot. I've realized sort of in the close conversations that a lot of the stuff I have been doing as a professor has mostly been structures to help me keep better tabs on what is going on in the field, which of course is now going to be only more important in this new job. <laughs> Just like knowing who's working on what and what new evidence is out there. So I have this online seminar series plan to keep that going, a conference every year, keep that going and the podcast. Um, so that's the big thing. Yeah, moving to Houston, I'll be spending a lot of time in DC and New York. Uh, we have a lot of our team is there. Um, and and basically just, I'm really looking forward to learning from the incredible people that are on the Arnold CJ team. Uh, it's just it's just a tremendous group of people who 
uh, have been working in the criminal justice policy space for a really long time, um, and uh, I'm going to learn a lot <laughs> both about about uh, the research they've been supporting, but also just these policy areas, which just hasn't been directly part of my job to be actively engaged in the policy conversation. And so that'll be much more proactively, you know, part of what I'm doing. Um, other than that, I am, I'm working on a book uh, called The Science of Second Chances. Um, and so uh, that will keep going. Uh, it's due to my editor in December. So um, I'm hoping to, to get that in on time. Um, but that that book is going to be on uh, basically what we know from the research on uh, the best ways to intervene at each stage of the criminal justice process um, to um, uh, to give people a real second chance and break the incarceration cycle. So I'm keeping that keeping that going uh, while I am starting to think about this transition out of academia and into the real world. Oh, that all sounds great. Got a bit of a um, <coughs> very deep voice. <laughs> So the last question would be, um, any life advice for people? Life advice. Oh my gosh. Um, let's see. I think, I think the main thing that I try to remind myself, uh, and hopefully will be relevant to other people too, is I think that we are all probably, um, uh, too cautious in terms of like taking, taking leaps, uh, making changes, um, leaving employers, leaving industries, uh, leaving relationships. Like, I don't know. I think there are a lot of things that, um, we could imagine either like sunk costs. There's a sunk cost fallacy here, which economists love to think about. Like I've already invested so much in this thing, so I don't want to leave. But I think also it's just a fear of the unknown. And, and so we're on that. We imagine, that the alternative is going to be like the worst possibility. Uh, and we know what we have right now, but in practice, I actually think like the alternative tends to be much better. <laughs> and so um, uh, I think I think a lot of us are too risk averse in terms of uh, in terms of being willing to make changes. And most of the time uh, when I, you know, talk to friends after they've you know, hemmed and hawed for ages about whether to make some leap, they're so much happier once they do. Um, and this is somewhat related. There was a study a couple of years ago by Steve Levitt uh, and probably some co-authors looking at, you know, they randomized people into just like, if they had some major life decision to make, they flipped a coin and then uh, did whatever, you know, they were, they were sufficiently torn that they did whatever the coin told them to do. And the people where the coin randomly told them to make the change and to take the leap were actually much happier uh, later. And so that that confirmed my my general hypothesis that I think a lot of us are too risk averse in making major life changes. So when in doubt, I try to take the leap. Take more risk. Um, take more I risks. had um, yeah, uh, I had an Im uh, someone who's a master improv actor, and there's a theme in improv which is always say yes. So yeah. that's one of the things. Mm -hmm. Well, on that yes. note, um, Jennifer Doliak, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This was really fun.